I want to get started. My name is Joanna Cohn. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control here at the School of Public Health. And it is uh, my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce today's speaker for our Innovations in Tobacco Control Seminar Series, Dr. Mira Aggie. So uh, Dr. Aggie has, is really considered a doyen of tobacco control, not just for India, but across the world. She began working in this area 40 years ago, and not many people can say that, uh, and has been a tireless um, researcher and advocate for all of those years. Uh, she's worked predominantly as a consultant for um, UNESCO and for the Indian Ministry of Health, for the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease and others. Um, sh recently, she's been working in India trying to train the National Tobacco Control Program cells or units, little departments, on all the provisions of the Indian National Tobacco Control Act. Um, so working to make sure that they know how to ensure compliance with the act. Uh, Dr. Aggie has uh, served on the board of our primary research society, the Society for Research on Nicotine and Tobacco. She has served on other boards as well. Uh, she's currently a visiting scientist at Harvard University. Uh, she's also received an honorary uh, professorship in behavioral science from um, a university in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and she has received three key international awards for her contributions to tobacco control. She received the WHO Commemorative Certificate and Gold Medal for continued commitment in the field of health to the cause of tobacco-free society. Uh, she received that in 1989 and was the first person in Asia to get that medal. She received the tribute for outstanding service to women from the International Network of Women Against Tobacco 10 years later in 2009. And just a few years ago in 2012, she received the Luther Terry Award in Community Service for Tobacco Control. And um, that really is, I mean, they're all great honors, but the Luther Terry Award is really, you know, um, outstanding. So I don't want to take uh, any more time. Uh, Dr. Aggie is going to talk to us about oh, about BD smokers today, and then uh, is really going to leave enough time for your questions and comments. So really look forward to um, having that interaction. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Everyone. Actually, there are two parts of to this presentation. One is with the BD workers and these are all men, and the other is with <coughs> chew tobacco, smokeless tobacco, with the women. I'll present this, and if there is enough time, we'll present the other, because, you know, it might take a long time to finish both of them, and I assume that you, your class is only up to one o'clock, and then you have other things to do. <coughs> BD smoking delivers two to three times greater nicotine and tar inhalation than do cigarettes due to greater puff frequency to keep the BD alight because it gets extinct, extinguished very easily. Readiness to quit smoking is the first step to quit smoking. In India, BD smoking construction workers show no readiness to quit. They have heard about the harms of BD smoking. They have seen the warnings on the BD pack that BD smoking gives throat cancer, but they do not believe. <coughs> now this is a bit of a background that BD smoking tends to be associated with a lower social standing. BD smoking construction workers tend to be composed of mostly illiterate or semi-literate individuals, poorly equipped with knowledge on the harms of tobacco, they do not seem to associate any health problem due to BD smoking. On the contrary, believing that BD smoking has benefits like helping them to stay alert if feeling tired while working and allowing them to take a rest. There are several anecdotes and if I get any chance I will tell those also because they are quite uh, interesting what people think. 
Now, what is the objective of this study? To discover by a consultative process those harms of BD smoking and their progressive development, which when understood by the BD smokers, will help them to make a decision to quit smoking beers. They could either say that they believe in the information provided or ask for more information, or decide that they will give up smoking, but not right away, or they could ask for help on how to give it up, or decide to quit right then and there. These are all the alternatives by this consultative process. The sample consisted of 47 construction workers from four sites in South Delhi. All the sites were within a distance of one and a half kilometer. The selection was made based on volunteering. They all hailed from two states of India, Bihar and UP. They were selected based on availability, language spoken because I spoke only Hindi, and being beauty smokers. Most of them had studied up to sixth or seventh grade. Three did not go to school at all, though learned to write their names, except for two of them, they were all in 30s. And on an average, they have been smoking for about five years. They were smoking about 10 BDs a day. I'm not sure if they had increased the number of BDs they smoked with time. This question was not asked. They were told that they can leave the discussion any time. The most common consequences of BD smoking are cancer, heart attack, and stroke. The idea was to educate them on these by a fully participatory and consultative process so that they are compelled to think about their own BD smoking. <coughs> on each of the sites, the interventionists sat with the group of workers to start the interaction. All the interactions revolved around the science of the disease. The focus was on science which progressively became more and more obvious as BD smoking continued. The format was more like storytelling and they are responsive to that. We made narratives on three diseases, oral cancer, heart attack, and stroke. Each narrative started with the signs of the disease. Using pictures, early signs and symptoms of the disease were shown. Inquiries were made if they have any of those symptoms. With the help of the picture, the progression of the disease was demonstrated to them. See, this, this is what helped them. I asked them, do you have these signs? Do you have sores in your mouth? Or anything like that? And this is how they responded. Mm -hmm. The main message was BD smoking increases the risk of oral, lung, stomach, as for GL cancer. Oral cancer is the most common in India. One out of every three cancers in India is an oral cancer. They wanted to know about oral cancer. See, they were, you know, it's quite frightening. Cancer is frightening. On being told that the early signs are discomfort in the mouth, gum, under the tongue, inside the cheek, cuts, sores, and any skin bumps. There was a commotion, and they asked to be heard. Five reported cuts and rash. Three gets rash, which repeats sporadically. One reported sores, which do not go and two reported burning sensation in the lips and under the tongue. See, this already made them enter into the things that we were talking about. They said, please listen to us. Please, we want to tell you if we have any of these symptoms. They looked concerned for oral cancer. They, looked, they consulted one another. They asked they can if they can look into each other's mouth. They wanted to see each other's mouth inside. But they saw two of them had white patches, one under the lip and the other in the cheek. And those of you who know about the precancerous lesions, it's a very early stage of precancerous, precancer. They all wanted their mouths to be examined. Many, of course, had no signs. Those with signs wanted to know what all these signs meant. And I told them that this is a sign that BD smoking is beginning to harm your health. I didn't say that you are going to get oral cancer or anything, but I said that this is beginning to harm your health. They were assured that there is a high probability that these signs will disappear if they quit smoking BDs. See, you cannot just frighten them. Fear, is in, fear also has to be in a particular amount. If, it is, if the fear is too much, then they become static, they become, you know, they, nothing goes in their mind. Some wanted to know if they can reduce the number of BDs they smoke. 
you know, this is the first question come to the mind. Can I reduce the amount of BDs that I smoke? And once again, science tells that smoking even one BD might be harmful. Because you cannot tell any untruth to the people. You have to be accurate in your science. Main message on the heart attack. BD smoking <coughs> increases risk for heart attack. Continued BD smoking leads to heart beating fast or slow intermittently. Early signs of heart trouble with more smoking can lead to additional signs like bad cough with mucus and regular irregular breathing. These signs come more often and then they stay all the time to lead to heart problems. The seriousness is related to the number of BDs you smoke. Four reported getting breathless by climbing stairs. Six reported feeling light in the head towards the end of the day. Eight said that they get uncomfortable while carrying a load. Seven felt they cannot climb the stairs carrying a load. And 11 commented that they get fatigued for no reason. <coughs> See, this was, this was again the entry into, the, into heart attack. I mean, they were trying to think, what is, do we have symptoms of heart attack? And it was being emphasized to them that it is due to their BD smoking. They seemed a little inquisitive and wanted to know if they can become risk-free by quitting BD smoking. Yes, these signs are likely to go away by quitting smoking. The more BDs you smoke, the greater the risk. And once again, smoking even one BD might be risky for you. Then on the stroke, the main message was during a stroke, you may feel numbness or weakness in your face, arm or leg, especially on one <coughs> side, confusion or trouble understanding other people, trouble speaking, trouble seeing with one or both eyes, trouble walking or staying balanced or coordinated, <coughs> dizziness, severe headache that comes in for no reason at all. One person spoke up to say that once he had experienced dizziness and was said that it was because of too much, and the doctor told him that it was because of too much BD smoking in hot weather. One more reported that he has to at times drag his leg, you know, the numbness feeling. Smokers of PD, when they experience dizziness every now and then and feel their limbs become heavy is a warning sign that they should quit BD smoking. At least seven looked hesitant to speak. They wanted to talk in private and three asked for privacy. Now look at the results. These were the people who did not want to believe that BD smoking is bad. But look what happened. 42 found the information convincing and believable. Remember, they had said that we have read the signs or we have heard about the signs, but we don't believe in them. And now, look, 42 found the information convincing and believable. 17 said that they are convinced, but they would need help to quit. They cannot do it on their own. 15 wanted to start reducing their smoking to half so that finally they can quit. Seven reported that they will smoke the beauties that they have in possession already and will not buy any more and then quit. Five wanted to speak in private before deciding the quitting timetable. Three said that they would need the process to be repeated with them and five we are ready to quit the same day. <laughs> and I think that we have, to, we have to think about what it is getting to, what, what, it is, what this research is indicating. All the 47 said that they do not want to get mouth cancer. 39 said that they were afraid of heart attack and would like to get help to quit. Three said that Stroke is bad because it leaves you useless and crippled. Mm. And two of them had relatives who had stroke and they were smokers. Now what is the conclusion? The interactions impacted each of the 47 workers. Not a, not a single worker stayed without being impacted in some way or the other. 
and made them think about their BD smoking, wondering whether to quit right away or quit later or quit after more deliberations. It demonstrates that the dynamics of the process has great promise. It is possible to cajole even those who may not have any knowledge of the health impact of BD smoking to start believing that BD smoking does not bode well for them. What is needed is a compelling <coughs> way to communicate to them the risks of smoking with their full involvement. <coughs> I think this is it. Now, either you can ask questions on this or we can proceed to the second um, you know, presentation that I have. That is also very, very, uh, you know, very, very interesting. But the women who chew tobacco, what they think about their chewing. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Or do you want to ask any question on this? Or do you want to have the question at the end? Yeah. At the end, OK. How do we achieve tobacco use behavior change among disadvantaged group? And they want to also tell you a little bit about the disadvantaged group you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in this presentation. No, the definition of disadvantage, as defined by Community Excel, disadvantage implies denied access to tools needed for self-sufficiency, tools which can help a person to make informed decisions, tools which can protect a person from damage to self, and tools which can help a person develop fully. Why work with the disadvantage? Am I crazy or what? Once they know why they are asking them questions, you know, they first of all, you have to explain to them why you have come to ask them questions. They, they have to really understand that you are not doing some, something, you are not going to harm them about their jobs or they are not going to enter into problem with the government or something else. So once they know, that you know these things are not there, then no problem. They are honest in their dis responses. What happens is that if we, if I'm asking you a question, everyone would guess a little bit. What kind of answer would she like to have? <laughs> you know, isn't it true? Yeah. But not this group. They are very frank. You will see in the presentation. They are very frank. They think I'm crazy in asking some questions. They do not guess what answer would be acceptable. They do not answer <coughs> to please others. In India, 23.3% of rural women compared to 14% of urban women use smokeless tobacco. Literary status is negatively associated with tobacco, uh, SLT use. 27.5% of women with no formal schooling, 24.9% with less than primary schooling, 19.8% with primary education, and 11% of, of women with secondary education and above. So it reduces as the education goes up. 22% of women in the lowest wealth quantile use tobacco. What is the objective of this study? To document the perceptions of disadvantaged women in India on their own SLT use to enable them to design, to enable me to design a health strategy. The main questions asked were, why do they use smokeless tobacco? What does it do to them? Do they know any ill consequences of its use? Would they like to quit its use? These were the main questions. The total sample was 59 women, age 22 to 37, maximum education seventh grade, have been consuming smokeless tobacco for a period of three to 12 years. Data was collected using focus group discussions and individual interviews. I think your teacher has already been talking about the qualitative data. This is all qualitative research. On opinion, thoughts, and attitude towards SLT use, knowledge about the health impact due to its use and the intent to quit. These were all qualitatively uh, researched. The questions were pre-tested to make sure that the women understood what exactly was being asked of them. See, it is very important because they may not understand what I'm asking. So I, I wanted to make sure that they really understood 
what question was being asked them. A couple of questions had to be reframed to make sure, to make them familiar in terms of language and some, a sentence construction. The anonymity of the respondent was maintained by not recording any personal identifiers, and the respondents were told that they have the option of meeting the researcher individually if they did not want to respond in a big group, they can quit the discussion at any time. Findings. Majority admitted that their first cons encounter with smokeless tobacco use was not as enjoyable as they expected. First time when they were using it, it wasn't as expected. I think many of you also must have, those who smoke must have felt that the first cigarette was not that pleasant. They started using it because everyone peer group around them was using it. One participant reported, this is very interesting, that she used to suffer from gastric problems and her friends recommended using smokeless tobacco to get relief from that problem and it has been a blessing. She hasn't had any gastric trouble. She is forever grateful to her friend, bless her heart. The users are gratified that their community has no objection to their using SLT use. The community doesn't object to that, but some other people do. It helps them to fortify their social interactions. Some of them reported that their employer <coughs> objecting to their SLT use, and many of them have commented that they considered leaving or changing job rather than giving up the use of tobacco. You see the addiction, power of addiction, that they would change their job, but they would not give it up. What are the perceived benefits of BD smoking? They all enjoy the taste of BD smoking, and uh, sorry, of the smokeless tobacco. It helps them to relax, to control hunger when they have no food. Look at all the advantages, all the benefits they have enumerated to control anger at being mistreated by others. I did a, another piece of research with seven servant, women servants, and almost all of them reported that they chew tobacco when they are being shouted at by their husband, beaten up by their husband, when he comes and takes all the money away. They cannot beat him back, so this is what they do. They open their thing and they start chewing to control hunger when they have no food, to control anger at being mistreated by others, get rid of their feeling of tiredness. When they are very tired, then they chew tobacco. Helps to forget their worries and their pitiable lives. Majority believe that SLT cannot be harmful as it is being promoted everywhere. In my country, if you go and the Indians will tell you here, it's being promoted everywhere, so it cannot be harmful. The government wouldn't allow its sale and promotion if it was harmful. They always ask us when we go to the field, you know, when we go to the villages, they said, if tobacco is bad, why doesn't the government ban it? You know, this is a question forever asked. 20 reported that tobacco use could lead to cancer, but they had no knowledge of the site or severity of it. Four mentioned chronic cough in connection with SLT use, but they qualified it by saying that cough could happen if the quality of tobacco consumed is poor or if the quality chewed is very large. None of the women mentioned that chewing tobacco could be harmful to the fetus of a pregnant or a lactating woman. No knowledge. They seemed irritated and amused at the question if they have ever gone to see a doctor. They almost laughed at me. They said, are you crazy? Is there a doctor to help you quit tobacco? They have no concept. I mean, cessation is not even heard among the educated people, but here they are, you know, they are very, uh, you know, they come from a different class. Their response was, are there such doctors who help you to quit tobacco? Because all that they know is that the, you go to the doctor when you have fever or cold or something. You don't go to the doctor, you know, when you are all right. And they are healthy. They don't say that they are suffering from any disease. What is the problem? 
we spend our own money to buy the product. What is your problem? <laughs> SLT is very dear to me. It is my only possession. Everything else belongs to my husband and in-law. This is the only thing I own. And you want me to give this also up? Quitting would be impossible. Where would we get the energy to work? How would we get sleep and be able to relieve ourselves in the morning? You know that smoking also as well as this is connected with that. If they would ever want to quit the use of SLT, they will have to be convinced that it is not good for them. See, this is the change which has come, that they will think about it. They also asked if the use, if the use can be progressively stopped or would it have to be given up all at once. Also, they will need help in learning how to quit. They would need to know in detail about each and every aspect how they will manage their lives without it. They also added that they would like to know what they should do when they feel the urge to chew and what to do when they get depressed. At least a thinking in their mind has come. They were heavily addicted. This is the conclusion. <coughs> they saw many benefits of use. They had a lot of anxiety for a life without smokeless tobacco. We also know addiction is a maladaptive part of learning and we cannot, it cannot be quickly unlearned. We all know that. It is a very strong addiction. Quitting is not simply a matter of willpower. Quitting should show benefits. We have to show them benefits of quitting. Now a little, uh, little experiment that I did with them, it is not uh, a very laborious one. I didn't work very hard at it because I was trying to see what their perceptions are. But then I thought, a YouTube video of voices of victims, my friend is here, he's also part of that, was shown twice in progression. I showed them twice because, you know, you show them once, they don't pay attention or they don't understand. I showed them twice. Then a compelling in-person communication taking them through a disease progression of users. I did that. What happens when people go on chewing tobacco? First are the white spots, then they turn into red spots. One more show than we had. 17 murmured they will think about their use. Three actually handed over the SLT pouch and said, we are quitting. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I went very fast uh, in my, you know, in presenting my slides because uh, there isn't any. They are not very intricate or anything to understand, uh, you know. So I, I thought I'll just, um, just expose you to those. who use SLT use, they belong to a particular class. And they have, you know, they are interposed in everywhere or every part of the <coughs> where, I, where I did this research. And they have such bounding, you know, with, with those groups that, and they are just like you. They believe in the same things that you do. They do the same kind of work that you do, you know. So this group, all of them, as if, have got this uniform thinking in their mind, 
that this is what you do. In fact, I remember one one more thing which I which I have not been uh, able to put in this. Uh, what happened was, uh, I think that you will know at some stage or the other from my Indian colleagues that we have a chewed tobacco which is manufactured, uh, you know, and it is called gutka. And uh, they were chewing gutka, you know, and then they said that, oh my God, the government has banned in some of the states. Actually, all over India, it is supposed to be banned. But some of the states in government in, in, in India have implemented them. So when Gurkha was banned in that particular state, it had gone underground, you know. So they would go in the evening all together to a pawn shop and they would request him to be Gurkha and he would charge them a lot of money, you know. And one of the women, when I was talking to them, one of the women said, you know, the Gutka has become very expensive and I am thinking of quitting, you know, I want help. And you know what the rest of the women said? Ha ha, don't say quitting. Why should you quit? You should ask your uh, boss to increase your salary. <laughs> he, should, he should raise your salary, you know. Why should you quit? You know. Mira, with respect to the access to Gurkha when it went underground, as you say, um, were women able to go out at night to purchase, or how did that interaction change? Very, very few. I think the, the bold one would go and then they would get, the others would get, you know. And then they can do away with other things. They don't have to have the Gurkha, right? Yeah. They don't have to have the Gurkha. They can buy tobacco and and you know, and even that twin pack, you know. So what used to yeah. happen like, so everywhere. So people used to switch to other products, and there was like, Gurkha is a mix of tobacco with snake lime. And so what they used to do is if they purchase raw tobacco and lime, and then manufacture, and it's prepared by themselves. Yeah. So yeah, the trend shifted, yeah. Yeah. Used to yeah. So but women could then buy the twin packs during the yeah, day? Yeah, oh, that, that okay. was no problem. Twin pack <laughs> was no problem. Right. That anybody could buy. But even the good cup was available, you know, but that was uh, uh, underground. <coughs> and I think the twin pack was also more expensive than the good cup, yeah. because there were two packs. Yeah. And thank you for the presentation. I really like the qualitative approach. And I think uh, I, I have two questions. One about the qualitative work that you show that at the end, three women said, right now, they'll quit. And in the earlier work, you showed that among the group, the, the heart disease and stroke kind of scared people enough to say that they were ready to quit. Uh, I guess my first thought question is, do you have some follow-up on them to know if they did quit? Because obviously, scaring people and saying, I'll stop is a lot different than them actually yeah, stop. But I, I think I would, I would qualify. I wasn't scaring them. Uh, how I went stage by stage, I wasn't scaring them. That was. You know, because I I am second uh, part of my personality is my I have training in communication and I'm very careful. I know that uh, communication will stop the moment they would become frigid if you frighten them too much. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate what you said that you couldn't scare them too much. I yeah. think just the messaging <laughs> right. a little bit does right. invoke right. a little bit of right. of concern yes. on their part yes. about what they yes. may. Yes, and you know. it is what moved them. It is what moved them. That is what moved them. And that is why, you know, they, they uh, decided. Now you are asking me about the follow-up. I did the follow-up in the little study of the servants. Where out of seven women, six of them had given up. But that was over um, two, two weeks. I followed, I, you know, I worked with them over two weeks. This is, this is in one shot. Right. This is not very right. much. The, but that was, I worked with them for two weeks, and for the first three days, I saw them three times. Once in the morning, once at lunchtime, and once in the evening. 
and then after three days they started saying, Madam, you don't have to see us. No, we know. No, we know. We, we will, we will, because my idea was to work with them so that they can go without it in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, you know. And then there were lots and lots of anecdotes. Lots of lots of stories I would tell them. And one day it was very, very touching that one woman came back and she said that, you know, last night my husband came and he was drunk and he started beating my son and I wanted to I wanted <coughs> to beat him, but I couldn't, you know, in in, in our culture we you know, um, why in our culture everywhere I think. A woman's behavior is, is supposed to be different than the man's behavior. And she said that it is at that time that I remember the stories that you were telling me and I did not, I did not chew. I held back, I did not chew. So it, there, is, there is this kind of follow up and then what I had told these women that I will come back to them and I will meet with them uh, after a month. After a month, I met with them, but not everybody could come. You know, sometimes it's very difficult. But out of them, it seemed that it was sustainable. Not only that, what was so wonderful was that you, he, two of them were saying, you know that I made that friend also to give it up and that friend also to give it up. You know. yeah. And there was one woman who fell sick, so she had to continue, you know, she couldn't give it up. And then she came back after about a month or so, I met her in the bazaar or somewhere, and she told me that she wanted me to help her again. She wanted me to tell her all about it and she wants to know. But remember that most of these people, they want to be talked about in talk to in a group. They prefer doing that. They don't like you going to one person and talking to them. They like to, you know, uh, you to address the whole group. And then they also agree what to ask you and what not to ask you. Mm -hmm. you know. They have got, going back to friends, they have got a very strong bonds mm -hmm. with, the, with the people and they almost can read each other's faces and mm -hmm. what more? Uh, you know, in your first study, you, you looked at, you, you talked some about heart disease and stroke. I was wondering, did you consider talking some about any infections? like tuberculosis. Did you consider talking to them about infectious diseases like tuberculosis with people who smoke these or increased no. risk no. for that? No, because uh, yes, really, of course, TB smoking is three times, uh, you know, TB producing. Yes, no, I did not. It's too much for them. It's too much. Even these, I thought, were too much because they wanted to talk only about oral cancer. They wanted to hear only about one cancer because that's what they were afraid of. You know, they they responded to a heart attack because they were getting tired when they carry the load and go upstairs. They were getting tired, so they thought that maybe it is the beginning of the heart attack or the stroke. Remember that man said, "I almost have to grab my leg." You know, so this kind of thing. Dr. Ravi, I'm wondering if um, you have plans to make bridges with health professionals like dentists or primary care physicians. It sounds like there's, um, number one, the need among your participants, but also the need for their providers to understand <coughs> that tobacco use is part of their health profile. And I'm wondering if you have been able to reach out to the medical I'm 73 now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have much time. Uh, you know, the, the problem uh, with this community, that whether it is the dentist or whether it is the doctors, you will have to forgive me, he's a dentist. You know? I can answer that. The doctor. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you go to these people for the trouble. For example, you have a tooth trouble and you go to the dentist. He will only talk about that. 
or not even talk about that. He will correct that and he will give you a prescription. There are very few dentists who would take time, although the dentists know that they are the first one to diagnose if there is any problem due to chew tobacco. Yeah, they are the first one, you know. But this tradition is not there. That's why I'm saying I'm 73. This will take a long time to really sensitize this community that, you know, I mean, even people like me, you go to a doctor and you ask what is wrong. No, no, nothing, nothing. It will be all right. You will just take this medicine. They don't like to explain. Right? Slightly for like, from the dental point of view, like there are initiatives which are happening. Uh, I myself with the faculty over there. Uh, I started uh, with the uh, Gupta and Miragi working in tobacco control. There is a shift, there is a shift in the momentum and as a dental faculty in this, uh, we have started like actively cessation at the clinic level. So training doctors, how to do actually like, uh, usually the concept was you have to quit, but that is, that's it. You can't, you don't show the patients to how to quit, what is the journey of quitting and there's a lot of science and a lot of uh, behavioral techniques, pharmacotherapy which goes in that and from the dental point of view, we. Uh, try to institutionalize it. So from third year onward, or from the final year, as a part of the their internship program or module, they have to you know do this as a tobacco simulation at the clinic level. So we have vendors at every nooks and corners. So from dental point of view, we were thought thinking like if each one has a choice, like to go and just for a quitting. So this way the training and infrastructure is just developed. But still, we need a lot of evidence because it's more of a smokeless tobacco we are fighting with rather than more smoking. He, he and I we did a little research mm -hmm. that is published also in what we journal. And it, uh, very interesting. You go to the, uh, it was a uh, research on point of sale, very interesting results. They just hide the, uh, the, the pictorial boarding on the other side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just had a question about like the educational aspect of, I guess, teaching these communities and other than going into communities and doing uh, like studies such as this to, to illustrate the effects, are there like, widespread, probably not, but are there widespread campaigns to teach? I mean, obviously in the United States there are camp educational campaigns about tobacco related products through the like, roof, but in India what does that seem like? Well, that is, that is one of the big problem, that there is no sustainable or consistent education which is given as a whole to the, to the whole, you know, to the whole population. We have campaigns, you know, every now and then you see campaigns, but they, they cannot have that much of an impact unless they are consistent and unless they are based on the needs of the people, what they need to know. There is a there is a difference between what you teach people from your point of view and what you teach people from what I need to know. And it is only that education fan will tell you will be useful, you know, to make an impact. Yeah, so uh, you Prime Minister of the country here seems say that, you know. 
and nobody says. There is no big voice about against that. The only voice is from the tobacco industry or the advocates, and our voice is, is so low, you know. Nobody at the big level says that what he's saying is rubbish. She's talking about, uh, you know, one, uh, one of the committee head who said that there is no, there is no relationship between beauty smoking and diseases. In India, in, in India, we don't have any data. Oh, there is heaps and heaps of data. Heaps and heaps of data. In fact, the best, res best research done in tobacco is smoking and smokeless tobacco is where he was. He is Saxeria Institute. They have done such solid research. You know. I'm concerned about um, how to reach low-income um, people. You said in your presentation that they don't usually um, seek medical. Um, they don't go to doctors, they don't go to dentists. Um, so who do they go to? And can we train these people in tobacco control? Well, no, but even if they went to the dentist and the doctors, what would be the claim? The dentist and the doctors except for few that he is talking about, and India has billion plus people, you know. They don't go to the doctor because there is no, there is no disease. I mean, I, I think one of the things which uh, probably you do not know and you have to appreciate that there is so many misconceptions in the minds of the people on the use of tobacco. You know, there is, in, in Kerala, the very prevalent belief is that they have carries, a lot of took carries, you know, and they are advised. I was surprised that in Ahmedabad, I learned that even the doctor advised to, to smoke beer mm -hmm. so that you can get rid of your took you know. <coughs> and, and of course, you know the prevalent belief that if you have gastric trouble, you chew tobacco or you smoke beauty. That alone will help you. Yes? I, something that I really struggle with in the Indian context is bee manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it's a really complicated issue in that it does actually employ a lot of people. I, I'd be curious to know what, what you've been thinking in terms of when and if we can transition away from a BD industry how an economic sort of solution can fill that um, real employment. I mean, millions of people, and often women, are working to hand roll the beaters. So um, do you have any thoughts about what sort of replacement or, or strategies for well, that? There, 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 are, there are things that they can do. But the people who own the beauty industry, God, they are potent. They are very, very powerful. So people like us and my colleagues, we don't have money, we don't have voice, we don't have power. They have everything, you know. The middleman is so powerful among the among those uh, <coughs> owners. The, the middleman handles everything and he's so powerful, you know, he 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 does anything that he wants in the field. For example, you know, the, he goes to these women who would produce, they are supposed to produce 1,000 beauties and then they are given 60 rupees or at the most 150 rupees or something. And he would take one third of it and he will put it aside. That this is, these are the bad ones. And then he will go and sell those, you know. I mean, it's so powerful. And those, those women have no other work to do in that village, you know. And, the, and, and there are organizations like SEVA in Ahmedabad. They do think that you can have alternative employment for these people, but you need money to, to employ them elsewhere, start a new work and stuff like that. You know. Thank you. Thank you.
but then you're able to reach about 70, 80 people. How do you, like, what are your... I was hoping somebody would ask that question. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would ask that question. This, this question, in a way, is like, uh, you know, some of my colleagues always saying, why do you do cessation? Do, do cessation maybe with 50 people, 100 people, 200 people. But we have billion plus. We have so many smokers. We have so many chewers. What is the impact of that? You know? And uh, the thing is, that is true. That is true. But I am very happy that you are <coughs> you. Now, this is a very small group, two groups. And you have seen that there are so many commonalities between the two groups. If you talk to them, if you find out what their knowledge gaps are, if you find them what the benefits they can accrue with their new behavior, they will change. It's likely that they will change. So you can take it up. You can take it up. And you do, of course, you will have to do research. There is no magic. You will have to do research of, on a bigger scale to find out what are the gaps in knowledge of most of the people. And then you will have to tease out the commonalities. Then you will have to go to their lifestyle, what kind of lifestyle they have, tease out commonalities from that. And then at a bigger level, you will have to address the commonalities. And you have it made. Not 100% will be effective, but great many is be effective. I am so grateful to you you asked this question. <laughs> because this is my big criticism. <laughs> you know, you have these little groups you are working with. Well, I have no money, I have no institution, nothing. I do this on my own, just for my own satisfaction. Well, I think that's a great way to, to end the discussion. And I mean, you have to start somewhere and really understand where people are coming from, yes, right? right? And you can't do that with large-scale surveys because you don't get the true understanding. So yes. it's really important to start exactly where you are. And then what you said is, and then build it up to be able to have a greater reach. So um, Dr. Aggie, I, we're starting a class at one, so we need to have this room available. But Dr. Aggie is around. If you have any burning questions, maybe we'll just step outside. But I wanted to <coughs> ask you to please join me in thanking Dr. Aggie for being here.